Am I audible? <laughs> okay, we should be speaking uh, uh, because uh, I have been told most of they are practitioners. So I have taken those cases. I have taken only those cases which are very relevant to you in your practice also. So I have not taken high end uh, uh, ICU cases except the one. So we will be discussing uh, what uh, multi drug resistant type of bugs are coming to us from the community also. So we will be discussing that and uh, it is going to be a simple presentation and I uh, will stop only when the rationality of those antibiotics is to be discussed and then I will go to the experts. Otherwise in the flow I will be speaking everything. Okay. So, so India is the largest consumer of antibiotics and uh, it is second, uh, second is China and then is US. And nothing to surprise, we become the antibiotic capital of the world. And as a result, we use antimicrobial use, abuse, misuse, overdose. And we have uh, having the highest antibiotic resistance also. And we have been named as the AMR capital of the world. So uh, this was about a decade ago when uh, Newsweek wrote these articles. And they were in the headlines, this is the death of antibiotics. And antibiotics is the end of miracle drugs. Now imagine the life without antibiotics. Uh, your common infections, what used to happen in pre-vaccine era, pre-antibiotic era. People used to die of tonsillitis, cellulitis, die of simple infections. Because the reason is this used to become bacteria and they used to die. Now uh, if these antibiotics don't work in today's time, the scenario is going to be very similar to that. All advancements of medicine, they will come to naught. Because imagine plight of cancer people, imagine the plight of uh, your transplant patient. Everyone will be suffering because all of them get infection and recover out of that. And that's the process they go through. So uh, imagine the life without antibiotics. And uh, WHO in 2014 said we are soon going to enter post-antibiotic era. So uh, these are the bugs. Which are ruling, they are, this is our super bugs. We will be discussing a few of them today. Now, uh, to summarize the whole thing, the rational antibiotic therapies can prolong the life of the antibiotics. If we keep it, using it left and right, then we will exhaust them because resistance will come and there will be no use. So, there is a need for sagacious, judicious, responsible use of antibiotics. And that's the reason antimicrobial stewardship is critical for the future of medicine. So straight away we'll go to first case. Uh, I'll be spending 10 minutes on each case. So there are four cases, 10 minutes on each case, and I'll run through those so that we discuss all these four cases. So the first case starts now. This is three-year-old, seven-month-old male, high-grade fever for three days. This child had earache on day one, admitted with outer sensorium and neck stiffness. These are the investigations we sent routinely in any serious patient and we did blood culture also. So I will come to Dr. Chikara. We have now four experts who are Dr. Chikara you know is an ID expert, Bello ID expert, Dr. Mihal is an intensivist, Dr. Mumbai is also an intensivist and I told Dr. Mihal is also So you are having a team who deals with difficult infections and I will be asking them these simple questions which are there. Number one, Dr. Chikara, what is the role of blood culture in the Laryngitis is an invasive disease. The very rarely matters in the sonorous. So therefore a blood culture must be Sir, a blood culture. Hello. <coughs> so blood culture invasive diseases. Especially pneumonitis, osteomyelitis, which are mostly hematogenous in origin. So, therefore, a blood culture is very mandatory because that is how you are going to pick up the etiological path and your treatment pattern becomes very easy. <laughs> Hello. 
Hello. So all invasive diseases, be it whatever organism or in that of genus, invariably in causation, so therefore a blood culture or an appropriate body fluid which is surrounding that organ is always mandatory if you want to pick up the pump which is infected and plan a treatment or a rationality maybe. Okay, anyone wants to add, add something? No. Okay. See, what happens is practically, patient gets admitted in the middle of the room. Straight away take the blood pressure, but many a times in most of the centers, the LP is done in the body. Because you have to give sedation, you have to see fundus, all those the routines have to be done. And that's the reason the child may not be hemodynamically stable. Again, the blood culture comes handy. And that's the reason it's very important to do blood culture. And it's going to be positive in 80 to 90% of the cases. Okay, sometimes there's a delay in doing LP. Now, empirical antibiotics in such a patient who is a meningitis, Dr. Snail, what do you choose today? Yes, so empirical antibiotics will depend upon our organism which we are expecting. So in a three-year-old, most common is going to be H. influenzae or pneumococcus. So this is a three and a half year old. Three and a half year old. So one step like one you should give. And uh, recently we have seen many instances of pneumococcal and H. influenzae being resistant to step like uh, In fact, let me recollect the paper from CMC well in 2017. From 2014, where the sensitivity of septriaxone to pneumococcal was only, resistance was only 4%, it has now jumped to 40% in 2018. So, we will empirically add a septriaxone and a vancomycin if meningitis is there. And as in the earlier talk, if you are looking at encephalitis, then we will even look at acyclovir, <laughs> malaria, hogato, balsigo, whatever. But if you are looking at meningitis, then septraxone <laughs> plus vancomycin, we should give. Okay. <laughs> I think there is unanimity of that. I think there is unanimity of this. High dose septraxone, not half RT. Yes. So septraxone, uh, 100 mg per kg plus vancomycin. We have been criticizing that what people used to use these two combinations 10 years ago. Uh, hitting the dancer, and we used to say there is no resistance in India as far as step pneumonia is concerned, which is the commonest cause. And uh, now, what has happened is first thing is antibiotics in meningitis, there should not be any delay because, as you know, the morbidity and mortality is very high, it's a time dependent condition like MI or stroke, must take immediate action. And this was the CSF report and very suggestive of meningitis, nothing to discuss about it. And uh, we started a septraxone and mycomycin. Why this change happened? As Dr. Snail said, we did start this septraxone and mycomycin. This change happened after this paper. And that is a paper done and written by Dr. Burgess and Balaji. And in this study, which is a study from 2008 to 2016, what happened was the blue line is uh, the resistance of streptococcus pneumonia, meningeal isolates. They are resistant to the tune of 42%. And if you see resistance pattern as far as the septraxone is concerned or supertaxine is concerned, it is to the tune of 28.5%. It means if I only give septraxone, my failure rate is going to be to the tune of 25-30%. So uh, the discussion in our rounds was should I count on this one paper and change everything? So, uh, this is a study done in Vellore. Why you should be following that? Because uh, the variation in antibiotics susceptibility varies from place to place. So, why you should be following this? So, we had a discussion with the, uh, Dr. Balaji, who is the author of this paper. And in detailed discussion, he told us he has got significant numbers of isolates from North India as well. So, it's very relevant to me. Unless I have a study, from North India, which tells me there's hardly any resistance, only then I'll change the therapy back to set, right? So otherwise I'm quite okay with this. And otherwise, also in your practice, you used to see a lot of meningitis. Dr. Dr. Uh, um, Satish is there, senior people, Dr. Uh, uh, Chakara is there. 
And see, we used to see a lot of meningitis in our student days in MDs and all that. So there's really biogenic meningitis has gone down. Even if we use in the occasional patient who comes in our practice once in six months, there's no harm in using this. And uh, what we should do, because I've taken the blood culture, this will be very relevant here. If it's long, okay. So, in this study, uh, we have. Hello? Okay, so in this blood culture was sensitive to penicillin and septrioxone. I go back to my uh, uh, experts, Dr. Abhuta. Uh, should I take this on the face value? No, sir, this is just a qualitative report. We give NIC value, that is the minimum inhibitory concentration of an antibody and that is the required to make sure that the organism, no survival organism is seen. So, as far as the, <coughs> if I'm wrong, but we follow CLSI guidelines. In the CLSI guidelines, you do an MIC of the streptococcal pneumonia. If the MIC is less than 0.5, then you can consider stopping mancomycin and just keeping castrazone or cefotexin, but make sure it is in the highest dose. Castrazone 100 mg per kg per day, 2 divided doses, and cefotaxin 300 mg per kg per day, 2 divided doses. <coughs> Any case, if you see the MIC is more than 1, or say between 0.5 to 1, that is also they say, if it is between 0.5 to 1, consider it as nearer to 1 and then please don't stop vancomycin and continue cestrazone and vancomycin both. Okay, very nice. So, uh, this is not the mistake of the microbiologist. We should have given her the, uh, I think uh, she gave a blood culture report. We should have given her if we want to use this MIC for meningitis. Possibly, she could have given the MIC for meningitis isolates. So, uh, we requested her. Uh, that uh, please give us her MICs. She gave this MICs for meningitis. It is 0.5 septrioxone. We continued the septrioxone, stopped vancomycin, as Dr. Amruta was telling you. These are the new latest guidelines CLSI. If uh, for CNS, if septrioxone MIC is less than or equal to 0.5, you can go ahead with septrioxone. Otherwise, uh, you should consider continuing with vancomycin as well. So, child was better. Markedly improved with antibiotics only on septrioxone, and this is what we got in ME panel. We are putting biopart these days, and there's this streptococcus pneumonia possible. So it confirms it is streptococcus pneumonia in the CSF, which was obvious as Dr. Kara told you. And secondly, we have confirmed this, and then we are using the blood culture MICs and to use on for meningeal isotopes. Uh, okay, we gave this 10 to 14 days. Unfortunately, Abhuta. This child deferred. So once the child developed deafness and it was a sensory neural deafness, we noticed on day seven or eight when we started speaking, the child was not answering. So uh, we got worried. So I think there was a discussion again in the rounds. One of the residents asked me, "Sir, we could have prevented this deafness by using dexamethasone. What's your take on this?" So we know pneumococcal meningitis is naughty to cause for deafness in around 60, 60, 50 to 60% cases. But whatever papers and evidence we have so far so now, etiologically if the organism is hit, then and then the dexamethasone is showing effect. But as far as pneumococcus and other etiology is concerned, it is not showing much of effect. So I would not have started, but yes, there is a difference of opinion. I have worked with seniors who straight away start dexamethasone irrespective of the etiology between the age of 6 months to 5 years when we don't know the etiology. But yes, for pneumococcal, it will not happen. There will be a big problem if you are giving vancomycin and yes. giving a uh, vancomycin and a steroid, it will be a big problem. Then the blue the effect of uh, your vaccine. Then we have to add rifampine then. Because uh -huh. uh, it will not allow vanco to enter. Yes. Yes. So exactly. If you give steroids, uh, then what happens is the permeability of membrane, meningeal, meningeal membrane decreases. As a result, then vancomycin cannot enter the CSF. So that's the big thing. Okay. I would like to just add upon the measure as far as ICU is concerned. The bacteriological diagnosis would come after 48 hours. So are you going to hold the steroid possible which will immediately? That question comes at any vector meningitis. that is, there are higher chances, 1 out of 10, can cause permanent sustainable so, but I would say, so that because, because, but there is evidence that this 
So it is definitely PSI coming uh, with uh, soft and skin tissue infection. Uh, should we de-escalate, uh, Dr. Ajay? Because we are giving two drugs, nevrolocytine as well as uh, vancomycin. Sir, for de-escalation, I would like to see MIC of vancomycin again. Okay, what was the value? And MIC of vancomycin low down in the second uh, uh, table is uh, quite less than 0.5. So, uh, if it's more than or equal to 0.2, I would say that it is not a wise idea to de-escalate vancomycin. I would like to continue with vancomycin. Okay. Because this is MRSA, cefoxifene screen is positive, so you continue with vancomycin. I am talking about cefoxifene. Cefoxifene yes, has to be stopped. It has to be stopped. Because yes. there is no MSSA, so why to give it? Absolutely. In MRSA, again, sir, this Why not give only vancomycin? Why we should have started up front with vancomycin only? Because that is that is not a vector static drug. Is going to kill. It's not a good drug for MSA. Yes. So vancomycin is not. Remember this. Vancomycin is not a good drug for MSA. So you have to give both, and after culture you can give. Okay. And uh, uh, is MIC important? Dr. Anil was telling me he is quite happy with 0.5. Okay. And uh, this is the net. Uh, and we de-escalated no MRSA, MIC for vancomycin. If it is less than 10, no change in therapy. But if it is more than two, there can be high clinical failure. Even if the report will come as sensitive, consider the change in therapy. Anything else anyone would like to add? Is you are okay with it? This statement? Two statements. Uh, even the moderator may not agree with me. <laughs> two weeks. This is a microdiagnosis disease. You have a bloodstream infection, number one. So therefore, you have to treat effectively. and. Uh, if I would have been there probably and like you said anaerobes also and if in my epidemiology I find that uh, Glinda doesn't have much resistance in my community which is now is about 20% probably I would have started with Glinda because it is also an infective as well as a toxic illness. Second word about bacteriostatic and bacteriocidal is a very relative term. We have always been list misled for the last 30 years. But static, the same drug can be static or sidled in different constitutions and as far as different bugs. So that doesn't hold true in the 20th, 21st century. Number three, in any case, you will not keep a child for two to three weeks in a hospital or an IV banco. And I am sure even he would have uh, de escalated to oral linezolid and sent that patient home. And to say that we could not have started linozolate at the onset, even if it was a bacteremic illness, there has been a lot of debate in the last 20 years. Vanco is gradually being weaned off because it is a very narrow therapeutic index and a toxin drug. API is somewhere around 30% in the therapeutic range. So we don't put down linozolate under the carpet, but yet use it only judiciously for such necrotizing lesions which are antitoxin, which are invasive, and which have associated BSI. So that is my take. Uh, my panelist and moderator may not agree with you. So uh, I, I let me clarify further on this. Uh, Dr. Sakara said clindamycin. Yes, uh, clindamycin is very important. Uh, it's not clindamycin. Because it covers MSSA, it covers MRSA, it covers another bug, Scatophobus pyogenes, it covers anaerobes. Fantastic. But the problem is, in recent time, we have been seeing inducible resistance in clindamycin to the tune of 30 to 40 percent, not 20 percent, as Dr. Kara said. Even 20 percent is very high. One. Second, whenever you have bacteremia, the drug of choice has to be vancomycin or dactomycin. Our experience of dactomycin is just when we push to the wall, otherwise we mostly use vancomycin. I agree with this statement of Dr. Jitkara, if this drug is so toxic it should retire. But unfortunately there is no other, there's no other person to take over vancomycin, then only can we retire. Okay. And sir, next, I just please cut off. Sir, the I would like to add something about MIC3. Because even if the uh, organism is sensitive to vanco and we have started because the uh, MIC is less than 0.5. Sometimes we see that after 2 to 3 days or 72 hours, the repeat culture is not sterile, you pulled out everything. Then there is something known as MIC creep. That means the MIC of the drug has gone to the intermediate or the resistant level somewhere between. That case also you have to consider <coughs> shifting the antibiotic to other drugs. Absolutely. Okay. 
I will go with DNA and DNA combination of pyritol or a pyritol sulfactam or a cyclotoxin sulfactam uh, as my so other choice. Another word, you have to choice. Another word, you I like it. It depends from area to area. Okay. And yes. what about Dr. Tara? You could have started on. Sick child who had lot of toxic system symptoms, I would eat with that right now. Yes, Dr. Amruta, because I think the pediatrician should get the view, uh, it is not only always one drug. Sir, yes, yes, chota yes. child, I would not go for B.I.D.I. because I am suspecting. It's a first-ever infection. Yes. I, I agree, I agree with Dr. Amruta, because it is very specific. Don't try it, don't do it, sir. Sir, try it, Because this is <laughs> I mean, yes, I mean, like zone because it is the first episode in USC KB is normal, no sign of pilot okay. Yes. okay, so we started on septrixone and with amicus. <laughs> now, as soon as the reports came and we found, oh, this is the. Uh, they could just be here. It was a stat dose. And then we realized, oh, urea has come 64. Creatinine 1.1 in a two year time, the creatinine should be 0.3 or 0.4 maximum. So we were worried. We thought this is the hit of the kidney. Most possibly this is pyelonephritis. And we immediately stopped after one dose. Because in UTI, it's a very good idea to start amicacin also because most of the bugs are covered by this in two days here. And it is a very concentration dependent antibiotic. You can give one dose and get it. We do antibiotics before the culture, sir. Okay. Empirical. Empirical. It is recommended. It is recommended. It is recommended. We stopped it because as soon as the KFT was in. What would have normal? What would have done? In this case, I will decide after culture and give one dose. Doctor, suppose you don't go to the report. At least, is it so that the all day burn, but then I don't know, I will start the two antibiotics? If it is UTI in today's era, yes, you may. No problem. See, there's a, see, there's a difference of opinion is because if you go through the UTI bugs, all are, most all are sensitive to obesity of today. Even this drug is 30 years old, 35 years old. All the bugs are very sensitive to amicacin. Just go through your culture reports today. So why not only amicacin? Why not only amicacin? See, what happens is you cannot depend on one. Because you are going to de-escalate soon after the antibiotics. You are de-escalating, sir. Sir, the reason is why the body... I think there is no need for discussion on this. This is no need for discussion on this. Dr. Baldev, let me settle this controversy. First of all, I don't have to ask a question from the moderator. Number two, personally we all can see 90% of UTI is a cause for EGL. We assumed it is ESGL, it could not be ESGL, number one. So we do treat with ceftriaxone alone, most of us, and that is the feeling what we get. And they, however, whatever reason they started, but they were intelligent enough to stop it after one dose when they got those KFT which were bad. The question is why two drugs? So we will not go into this controversy, but I think single drug in a, a kind of a, even if I think acute pyelonephritis in a patient coming from a community, ceftriaxone would suffice unless we so have our local epidemiology. It is pyelonephritis. So you don't want to take any chances because another group is saying Pipasnet has a back from the higher end antibiotics. <laughs> Okay, okay, go ahead. Okay, then there's no response to septriaxone. I think there's no response to septriaxone. I fever continued, and since the culture report comes, and see this culture report, and this is the scare we are having today when I say it's death of antibiotics. Your septriaxone MI is more than yes. More than 64. So if you see the report today, Dr. Baldev, next time you will give amicacin. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. 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 Because I have seen many reports like this. Okay. Just a minute. Because otherwise you won't complete it. After seeing the KSP. Okay. So this is the report. And uh, in this report, MICs are more than 64. Then see the blood culture. Absolutely ditto report. Absolutely ditto. 
So this is ESI blood stream infection originating from urinary tract. So it is from pyelonephritis. Absolutely heterotrophic. So what to do? And uh, I go to again the snake. Yes. So there is the this is active infection. This is uh, I will continue with. Uh, so, septrioxone of resistance is defined as MIC is more than 2 microgram per L. So, it is there. So, it is a proxy for ESDL production. Choice of antibiotics on the basis of culture report. How true Dr. Uh, name is? I will still continue with BSD. Although there are people who are itching to say that this is a very sick child, this is pyelonephritis, you should go to. No, no, no. Right now, everybody is on the same time. So, amyloglycoside I cannot give. Number one, because there is a hit on the kidney. Cephipine, it is not very good against ESD. BLI combination, yes, agree, Dr. Nail. Carbapenem, meropenem, yes, we may. Digicycline, no way, even if sensitivity has come, because these are all drugs which are sensitive. Digicycline doesn't come in the yeah. event, so no idea. Three minutes. Three minutes. We can read with this and don't go to the fourth case. Okay, digicycline uh, and then nitroferentoin, again, doesn't enter the tissue. So, amoxiclab was intermediate sensitive. And we won't take a chance with intermediate cells no. in case of pyelonephritis. I would have taken a chance of this instead. Do you want to agree with this? Sir, if I was only urine, then I would have gone for BLBL. But if it's BSI with urine showing, we'll then I would that. go for BSI. So, we have been choosing piperacillin tazobactam, and we chose piperacillin tazobactam. And Sir Dr. Snail chose up front. And we chose after uh, our septrioxone failed. So now what happened was one person raised, this is two years or three years old case, and one person raised in the round of some, what about Merino trial? So yes, so Merino trial does say that Meropenem visa with a BLDLI combination, Meropenem, the BLDLI mortality was significantly more, or in fact, if I may put it more properly, as Fury said, they tried to prove that the BLDLI was non inferior to Meropenem. And they showed that it was definitely not the case, it was inferior. But having said that, in the same breath, let me tell you that the patient which they selected was six patients, immunocompromised, who had received an antibiotic in the past three months and, in, and hemodynamic compromise. This child did not have either of these three four things. And therefore, I fully agree with the same. And continue with the PLI combination. Yeah, and again, uh, this is a, I would say that still G is not completely out. There are two schools of thought that Picasin is considered as a carbapenem sparing drug. And on other way, in the same study, they were told that the mortality is high, 1.9 times, which was very significant. So, if you use Picasin as a vector, what has mortality high? And if you give the message in the Indian population that no Picasin as a vector, you use Chinese people to die and use carbapenem, then you will be again blending up with the Mumbai world. So, probably in the current scenario, we are not. Okay, so uh, what my experts are telling, I am summarizing three, four slides. What they are telling you? First is the Merino trial was done in adults, 26 sites, 9 countries, including Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, and many other countries. Okay? <coughs> then it's supposed to be a landmark trial. Most people discuss about this. So, what happened was 30 day mortality was 12.3% in PTZ group, that is Pictus in Tazobactam. It was 30 day mortality in Neuropenem was 3.7. But the criticism is, this in Merino trial, there were more sicker patients in the Pictus in Tazobactam. And a lot of people have questioned that. If you have more sicker and terminal patient in Pictus in Tazobactam, how you can expect better results with that and how it is not going to be inferior. Now another thing is, they definitely believe the randomization was not proper. And what happens exactly as a student of uh, ID? When you use uh, phenotypic cultures, and in this phenotypic culture, it comes sensitive. But what happens is it hides 
if there is a associated oxa or associated mc in the bug for example it comes sensitive the bug is also carrying oxa bug is also carrying mc so as a result the result is given for esbl but not for oxa so as a result what happens you feel it is very sensitive they have been post hoc analysis also in this they found even if the mic is more than 16 the drugs fail if the mic is are 2 the drug succeeds as far as people are saying tensor is concerned and last why what we discussed in our rounds was see it has been proven that e coli bacteremia originating from uti or biliary tract is supposed to be a low inoculum infection it has been discussed in the post hoc analysis also it is not true with Lexella pneumonia. UTI is a low inoculum infection. Patient condition is not critical. If the child doesn't have any other comorbidity. No anatomical defect like gross VUR which could appreciate on ultrasound. So as a result, we gave Petrocellin Tazobactam and succeeded. And uh, we discussed in our rounds that in this case, if we fail in 48 hours, we'll definitely go ahead with Neuropan. Because uh, uh, we must give drugs which are carbapenone sparing. Otherwise, you will end up with the ICU having a lot of resistance against Miropanol. So, uh, should we give aminoglycosides on discharge once a day because the patient became okay after seven days? Or previously, like all after eight hourly, if a patient has to come to the hospital every eight hourly, it's better not to discharge. While cefparazone, some vector may be given 12 hourly. Or I use intermediate drug. We get this high dose of for amoxiclab and got away with the two weeks completion of the course. And uh, I can stop here, not complete the fourth phase. Just a comment on Marino. While Marino concluded that Carpa pendulums was better than Petrasil and Tazobactam as regards the 30 day mortality was concerned, yet there were certain limitations which both of them have mentioned. So now Marino 2 and Marino 3 is in progress. But I am sure by the time their results come, even Petrasil and Tazobactam and the way Barbapenum resistance is growing, next time we need to mind about the UTI, probably we will be using something else like uh, Septazidium and Edibactam rather than talking about Petrasil and Tazobactam. Let's come in with this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll stop here because I think uh, uh, this time we have run out of time. I wanted to compete in 40 minutes everything, but uh, okay, thank you. Thank you.